In this holiday special, we turn now to one of the country's best-known spoken word artists, Saul Williams. Twenty years ago, Saul won the title of Grand Slam champion at the New Yorican Poets Café. Over the past two decades, Saul Williams has forged a career mixing poetry, music and acting. In 2014, he performed in the first Broadway hip-hop musical, Holler If You Hear Me, a musical inspired by Tupac Shakur. He's just released his fifth album, Martyr Loser King. I recently interviewed Saul Williams and began by asking him about the title of his latest album, Martyr Loser King. It's, it's an obvious play on words. Uh, 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 martyr, loser, king. Martin Luther King would be one of many martyr, loser kings. Uh, martyr, as in those who have either been killed because of the, you know, the work that they've done for the upliftment of humanity or what have you, or, or those who haven't been killed who give their lives just through service to humanity, okay? So, a martyr is connected to the idea of sacrifice, and those who give their lives or sacrifice the possibilities of wealth or what have you for the sake of humanity. Um, the loser, um, basically what I'm referencing is the disenfranchised, those who identify as belonging to a disenfranchised group um, and, 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 you know, not necessarily find pride in that, but can say, yeah, I belong to that group, or, you know, I, I'm not handsome, I don't have the fancy car, I don't have any of this stuff. You know, according to social standards, I'm a loser, but I'm, I'm happy with my life. Um, it is the screen name of a hacker. It's a concept piece. In fact, the title came from me. Uh, I was living in Paris at the time, and I heard a French person mispronounce the name of Martin Luther King as Martin Luther King. And <laughs> I reflected on it and thought, that's kind of brilliant, because there was so much going on in the world. I started working on this, I'd say, around the time of the Arab Spring, and, and thinking about all of the people that were starting to protest and stand up, followed by the Occupy movement, and, and just there's been so many protest movements, and, and you know, that quest for democracy is worldwide. Um, my story is based in Burundi, where there's an ongoing quest for democracy right now. There's another character in my piece who's from Uganda, who's a refugee from the anti-gay laws there. Um, her name, the character's name is Neptune Frost, uh, another quest for for democracy there. I'm American. We know what's going on here. Uh, my family lineage is from Haiti. We know what's going on there. Um, there is a global quest for democracy, and I essentially wanted to create a, a modern parable, parable where I kind of took all these social issues where there's so much to think about and talk about and kind of dumped them in my drum machine and created this thinly veil, veiled fiction where I could, uh, you know, play with these ideas in the context of these characters and this story. Uh, surrounding, essentially, a hacker by the name of Marta Luther King. So, Burundi. Yes. I'd like you to perform it. Um, sure. It's on Marta Luther King. Uh, and talk about why Burundi. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it first, because, in fact, I started working on this song uh, way before what has recently happened in Burundi, since their president, um, in Kurunziza, has changed the Constitution and is now serving uh, what one, some would call an illegal uh, third term, and is, of course, you know, suppressing the voice of journalists and of protesters. There's been over 200,000 uh, refugees that have left the country in the past six months. There have been uh, hundreds of murders um, from people speaking up against the government. None of this had gone down when I started writing about it. I started writing about it primarily because my wife uh, is from Rwanda. And so, uh, over the years, I've learned more and more about the Great Lakes region. Of course, uh, there's lots of, lots of interesting things that happen there. One, like 80 percent of, of the cobalt and coltan uh, that our technology is dependent on comes from that region, okay? And as you can imagine, the story around those mines and the exploitation that occurs around those mines are the sort of things you probably don't want to think about when you're taking a selfie. <laughs> you know, you really don't—you you know, it's the sort of things that we don't want to consider, consider uh, in larger industrialized nations when we think of the sort of exploitation that's necessary to ensure our comfort, right? 
the story is not necessarily about that, but it starts there. Um, and uh, and so from there, I chose Burundi primarily because. Uh, Bujumbura, the capital, was sort of a destination for many people living in that region, the same way we may dream of going to Paris. People would talk about the music, the food, the nightlife, and what have you. And so I started creating this, like, uh, parallel universe and this fictitious landscape where our main character, Marta Luther King, is from. And so I'll, I'll recite the, the song for you, um, and, and then we can talk some more about it. But it goes like this. Um, Running down a dark street at that guy a flashlight, Nike swoosh on bare feet, Whitney Houston's crack pipe, the greatest love of all, watch me rise to watch me fall, contemplating renters laid in houses that I can't afford, show my papes at heaven's gates, they asked me for my visa, lived a life without no hate, so tell me what you need, sir, question your authority, genocide and poverty, treaties don't negate the fact you deal in stolen and property. Hacker, I'm a hacker, I'm a hacker in your hard drive. Hundred thousand dollar Tesla ripping through your hard drive. Oh, Jesus, pull the cord. Seatbelt, what you standing for? Buckle up, let's knuckle up and tell Muhammad, bring a sword. Swoosh, I'm a candle. I'm a candle. Chop my neck a million times, I still burn bright and stand, yo. Visual in the middle of your occupied locations. One that burns for hate. One that burns for Haitians. I'm a candle. I'm a candle. Chop my neck a million times. I still burn bright and stand, yo. Standing in the middle of your synagogue and chapel. Licking that forbidden fruit through bitten, glowing apples. Factories in China. Colton from the Congo. Smuggled to Burundi. Hidden in a bongo. We beat a mighty drum. Changes go before they come. Gun and ammunition, pay tuition for the desperate young. Hacker, I'm a hacker, I'm a hacker in your hard drive. Hate ain't no security, I'm hacking through your hard drive. Information highway, tunnel vision highway. Exit 17, yo, bring the mother, mother my way. Virus, I'm a virus, I'm a virus in your system. Your history teacher, I've never been a victim. I'm just a witness, Hitler can come get Get this rabbis in Ramallah throwing burkas on these is I'm a candle. And so essentially, this song takes a Rumi poem. It was inspired by a poem from Rumi where he says, I'm a candle. Chop my neck a million times, I still burn bright and stand. And I thought of that because, like, when you think of even, like, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement right now and so many, you know, social movements happening today they, that are happening without singular leadership. And I think it's actually brillant, because we learned from COINTELPRO and so many past movements how it was so easy to knock out a lead, leader and quell the movement. And so now, through social media, through Twitter and all of these things, we're able to mobilize without actually having a singular leader. And, uh, and so I found that, that poem inspiring and, and went on to create this song surrounding this character, um, which is, like I said, thinly veiled fiction, really there to provide uh, an alternative source of energy for those who are mobilizing to create democracy now globally. Hmm. Well, wow. Saul so, Williams, you left the United States. You went to live in Paris for mm -hmm. four years. Of course, uh, uh, James Baldwin comes to mind. Yes. Um, most recently, Tanhasi Coates uh, mm -hmm. moved to Paris. Talk about why you left the United States, and also it gives you a different view of Africa, particularly the former yes. French colonies like Burundi and Rwanda. Of course, I spent a lot of time on the continent of Africa while living there because it's much easier to go. Right? Well, you know. Of course, there are people like, like, like you said, like James Baldwin, Nina Simone, Josephine Baker. That that the, the history list is long of those people who chose to go there. I can't say that I chose to go there for the same reasons. I was living in Los Angeles, and uh, and essentially just realized that if I. I was dreaming of doing stuff like that, living abroad. I had done it as a teenager, living in Brazil, and it really changed my perspective, not only of myself and of the world, but how I looked at the States, because it's a different thing to look at the States from the outside. And, uh, and so 
I decided to move to Paris primarily because, one, I had a 13-year-old daughter who I wanted her to have the, the sort of insight that comes from looking at her country from the outside and to experience another way of seeing the world. And, uh, and because my, my first film, Slam, and, uh, you know, won the Camador at Cannes, and, and uh, my first album was released in France a year and a half before it was released in the States, I've had a good relationship uh, primarily in, in France and, and across Europe and decided to, to try it out, to try it out, um, and just to see what it would feel like. Um, and arriving there, it was interesting on, on many, you know, like in many small scale, but which are in indeed large scale ways. For example, I remember my daughter getting a little bronchial cough, and I'm there. I don't have health care there. And so, you know, there, anyone coughs, they're like, oh, you should go see a doctor. First time they cough. Here, you know, we're like, you know, we wait till we're really sick to go see the doctor. Go see the doctor. Pneumonia is the standard. You're right. Here. You know, pneumonia is the standard, exactly. But everybody's saying, no, take her to the doctor. So I'm like, okay, oh my God, I know how much I have in my account. I don't know if this is going to be cool. I take it to the doctor. Doctor, sure enough, yeah, there's a little bronchial cough there. Um, he wants to prescribe five different things. I need to go to the pharmacy across the street to pick up. And then, you know, he's like, and I'm going to have to charge you for this visit. How much is it? Oh, 25 euro. You know, 30 bucks. Okay. Thank you. I then go to the pharmacy across the street. And I get five different, you know, there's a syrup and pills, antibiotic, all this stuff. It all adds up to like $6.50. And it's at that moment, essentially, that I realized that people who have like a single payer healthcare system, they are, it actually affects culture, life in ways that here, for example, we, we actually can't imagine. You know, we're afraid of growing older and getting sick, for example, because we know we. I know people who try to keep their job because they need a way to pay for the operation that they know they need and all this stuff. And there, it's a different thing. Same thing with education. You know, uh, the idea of, like, you can be whatever you want to be. It's not going to cost you so much just because you're passionate about medicine and you want to be a doctor or you're passionate about law and you want to become a lawyer. It's, it's, it's not going to cost you that much if, you know, you live in this sort of socialist country like that. Um, and so uh, being exposed to, to this, uh, ha you know, that reality and how it affected how people think and what have you was enormous for me. It was enormous for me. Yeah. And how did it affect the way that you saw the African countries that you got to visit, well, being in Paris? Yeah. I ended up spending a lot of time, particularly in Senegal, I shot a film while I was over there um, in French and, and, and Wolof called Tay or Aujourd'hui, and, um, and ended up spending about three months in Senegal and then traveling to other countries and other regions as well. It wasn't my first time, um, but it was the most time I had spent. And, you know, even in Paris, the, the African community there in Barbès and, and what have you is strong. Um, you know, the thing that that charged me is just the layers and levels of dialogue that I was able to have about politics, about global infrastructure, um, and, and seeing how informed the average person is. And how was it for your 13-year-old daughter to go to school? She went to public school there, um, and, you know, First, she's in, like, French as a second language course, you know, when she starts off. And the first day, she comes back from school, and she's like, uh, oh, guess what? They have us translating Nina Simone songs in school to learn the language. Another day, she comes home, and she says, today I was in class, there's, you know, like, there's tons of people going to France. So there was an Afghani boy in her class who, in the middle of class, he gets in trouble because his phone rings. He runs out and, uh, and, and comes back crying. And, and, uh, and the teacher explains, after he explains to the teacher, who was Algerian, what, you know, went down, um, the teacher explains to the class, he's crying because his family was just killed by your country. That's what she says to my <laughs> daughter. And so she comes home and tells me the story. I say, well, what did you do? She was like, I sat with him at lunch and told him, I'm sorry, I'm not that kind of American. 
<laughs> it makes me want to cry. But it was so bizarre for her to be exposed to, you know, the, the sort of reality that our foreign policy imposes on others that, you know, that we're shielded from here. Poet, activist, and musician Saul Williams will be back with him in a minute.